Folks, welcome back to another great Word on the Street. This is part two with these incredible men, these generals, Benny Prophet of First Priority Global, and of course, yeah. Dick Salisbury. How you doing there again, I'm sir? doing great, thanks. All right, you know, before we started filming, of course, this, this is yet another working show. I'm not sure if you've heard what a working show is. We're getting things done as we're filming, uh, transferring these incredible videos and presentations of First Priority all over the world. I mean, you just showed me just a few of the countries Unbelievable yeah, what has happened. When you, when you go to firstpriority.global, you really are going to a dot global. It is all <laughs> over the world. I'm blown away. You're going to begin to see great stories of people that God has taken and uh, and put them before kings, you know, and, and that's, that's, right. that's what he does. He is a God of destiny. You were talking about Samba. Sampath. Uh, Sampath. Sampath. Tell, Sampath. Tell us about him. Well, Sampath is our director in Sri Lanka. And uh, I met Sampa through a network that we helped develop in Southeast Asia, and he wow. was one of the guys that just came. And so we started talking about First Priority, and he said, I want to be involved. i got to do this. And I said, well, tell me, tell me about Sampa. Well, he was, uh, b he was born into a Buddhist family. The mom left him at the hospital when he was born. Wow. So never knew his mom and dad. Uh, was uh, taken into a Buddhist orphanage and uh, was always told, he said, when I was a little boy, they always told me I had no worth, that my family didn't even want me, so I didn't have any worth. Wow. And there was, uh, when he was in five years old, they asked all the children to draw a picture of family. And he didn't even know what to draw. He didn't know what a mom was, a dad was. And the, the problem they had with him, he said the whole, all the people in the orphanage, orphanage said, you have no value. The problem was he was the smartest kid in school. Oh. Made the top grade. So here's this kid who has no value, so they don't know what to do with him. And he's always mistreated. So when he's 15, he runs away from home, oh. runs away from the orphanage, and lives in the street and gets a job at a restaurant cleaning the toilets. And he just told the man, I'll do whatever you want me to do just so I can have a place to sleep and some food. And so he, and now that's when he's 15. At age 18, he was the manager of the restaurant. That's how smart he is. Wow. Lady comes into the restaurant uh, and witnesses to him, he comes to Christ. Then he realizes, he just told the owner of the restaurant, he said, I can't do this anymore. I have to go preach the gospel. Oh, wow. And so this lady sends him to Bible college. And this kid who was born in a hospital, parents abandoned, abandoned. grew up in a Buddhist orphanage. Told he's worthless. Is, is now the leading youth evangelist in Sri Lanka. In, the, in all in of Sri Lanka. Country. Has his own radio talk show that he put together <laughs> himself. And in fact, he's already we've already sent him to Dubai. He's been preaching over in Dubai, teaching oh, First Priority in wow. Dubai. And so the guy's amazing. That's one of 50 stories we could tell you of the people that God has brought to us. Uh, they already love Jesus. They're already committed to reaching the youth of their nation. They're just saying, we need help. We, we, we want to do what we're trying to do better. And I think our uniqueness in First Priority, you guys know about First Priority, but I think when talking to the people here listening, our uniqueness is with First Priority is that it's a peer-to-peer -peer ministry. Right. It's a peer-to-peer -peer evangelism discipleship strategy. I was a youth pastor for 30 years, and I was taught in youth ministry it was adults talking to kids. So my program, uh, let's, let's have Wednesday night and all the kids come listen to the youth pastor talk. Right. Let's go on Sunday morning, let's listen to all the Sunday school teachers talk. Then let's have a discipleship and let's have an adult discipleship leader talking to the kids. So youth ministry... All I knew was is that it's a bunch of adults talking to kids. Right. Well, I, then I was a basketball coach early on in my career. And I said, now think about this. What if you said, guys, I want you to play on a basketball team? They say, yeah, we want to play. And I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to meet every day after school, and I'm going to tell you about basketball. <laughs> we're going to talk about basketball, and I'm going to teach you what it is. I'm going to show you what the plays are. I'm going to show you how the game, and that's all we're going to do. How many basketball teams would there be? Not very None. many. None. No. What are the kids saying? What are the coach? We, we want to play. We want to play. Put me in. Don't tell me what <laughs> basketball is. I said that is the picture of first priority. We said we're going to quit taking kids to church and telling them what Jesus said, or telling them what they're supposed to do. We're going to give them a way to go do it. And when they begin to own their faith and they begin to learn to share their faith, everything changes. Because it's, uh, there's a concern now. You read all the stats where kids are, and they get out of high school and they're walking away from the church. 
Right. Well, especially in, in America. Yeah. In American kids. Yeah. And I'm saying, you know why? Because yeah. they never own their faith. All they sit, they sat and listened to other people talk about their faith. Their faith didn't become their own until they went to college. And many and of the times at the expense of, every, of, of a lot of heartache. So you know, when, when, their faith when, when you get a 13-year-old to own their faith, not only own it, but live it out and then begin to articulate, be able to successfully share their faith, then when they're a senior in high school, you don't lose them. They go on, they're already in ministry. They're already seasoned veterans of the gospel. Wow. They've already done ministry. And I said, so the problem with losing all these kids is they came and watched us articulate our faith. It never became theirs. And, and, and there's been a, lo a long frustration with, with that model. <laughs> I mean, ask a senior pastor. You know, I've, I've been in children's ministry, yeah. youth ministry, worship ministry. Pastor, you've seen outreach. it all. Yeah. I've been in those shoes. And it's like, well, the, the model is people come and watch, and then the pastor could be frustrated that they're not out evangelizing. Well, that's not how they were taught. Same thing with, with the youth, too. I've been a youth pastor, you know, and, and, of course, you know what it's like reaching young people on campus and then sitting in a church, big, beautiful church. Mm -hmm. Most of them are empty during the week, but we mm -hmm. love you. Mm -hmm. Man, I, I got to get back on campus, and that's what you did. Mm -hmm. That's how this whole thing yeah. started. Mm -hmm. My first priority, and I want to appeal, you know, in the first show we talked to, to people that want to uh, know that they're, they're investing in the kingdom, uh, you know, and in the, in the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. I, I'd like to encourage you pastors and youth pastors, how, I've been in your shoes, okay? Look what's happened in our culture, you know? I tell you what, uh, if, if you really, really, really want to be serious about reaching young people, Get, them, get involved in what's working. Get involved in the vein of what's already on these campuses of these schools like First Priority and all over the world in First Priority Global. Get into a vein. I mean, all these pictures you're showing me, all these groups all over the world are being yet led by young people. Mm -hmm. And that is true discipleship. It's, well, it's not a spectator done. model. It, we, it, it, it's a disciple model. What we do. I did it. I'm saying, so I'm, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody out there. I'm pointing the finger at me. Right. What, what I did, what I was taught. Me too. Is we made hearers of the word. We made counterfeit Christians. Here's what, the, here's what James said. If you're hearers and not doers, you've been defrauded. You've been given something that has no value. You've been given wow. a counterfeit. And you know what I did? I made a bunch of counterfeit Christians. They you didn't thought, mean to. They thought the way. You didn't know. I, you didn't all know you were. And I didn't know. So they, that, I basically thought, if you come, sit and listen, you're a believer. So I created, a, my whole ministry was, how many people can I get to come, sit, and listen to me? And James said, if they're hearers but not doers, they are, they're, they've been defrauded. They've, we've made counterfeits. The, the enemy of the best is the good. It's great and wonderful to come together, of course, in fellowship, mm -hmm. but the best. What, what I learned in youth ministry is discipleship. my success was not what kids did to come listen to me or even to do ministry with me. I was successful when they did ministry without me. When they were out there and they had their own ministries, I had been, I truly was now the equippers of the saints to do the work of ministry. And I said, so when we started doing first priority, I said, now I know whether I'm successful or not, not because a kid comes and listens to me, or even if he goes on a, a camp with me or a mission trip with me. I'm successful because when he has nothing to do with me, he's out doing ministry. It's his ministry now. And I said, that's how I'm, I learned to redefine and remeasure my success. What, not what kids are doing when they're with us. What are they doing when they're not, when they're not with us? Where does it say in the Bible the proof is in the pudding? <laughs> See, I, it must say yeah. that in the Bible, oh, but... Yeah. A lot of these guys that are that are his leaders today, 26, 27, 28, they came to the Lord through first priority, mm -hmm. and yeah. they are part of it, and they do have their own religion. They're not putting it behind. And that's the only clubs over there. That's what Benny said. You can go to any of those countries, first priority, first priority. They don't have others. Yeah. But I'd like to make a comment of, uh, relative to today and what the Supreme Court's doing and all this things that are happening over here based on that guy in Sri Lanka if his mom and nobody would have ever known it if she had had him aborted look what the kingdom would not have had because of that, that is so, right. so you look today at all these women that are standing and hollering for abortion 
What if their moms had have thought that? And any of the guys doing it, if your parents had have thought that, you wouldn't be here to do what you're doing. They didn't believe in abortion, mm -hmm. or you would have been aborted and you wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So we all need to be thankful that things are turning yeah. around like they are. And we're seeing it over there where people that are here, sometimes you think by accident because something happened or somebody didn't abort them. It's no accident. God has raised them up to be mighty in the kingdom. We don't know where that guy's going we spoke about a while ago. He don't have to go anywhere to already be great. Mm -hmm. There's no telling how many souls are coming in the kingdom because of him. Because and first priority has got, they don't even know where they're going. <laughs> Doors are opening so fast. Yeah. It's like one of these shows. Which, which door do you want to go behind? And <laughs> Golly, you look and there's three doors and then there's six doors and then there's nine. Yeah. They, they're, they're needing help. Yep. They're needing help with people to come, but they're needing help financially because these yep. doors are just opening. And the reason doing it, you know, we're here nearing the end of 6,000 years that we were given for redemption. And when that 6,000 years is up, some of us think it's going to be about 2030. It could even be before. We're going to go in the millennium, and there's not going to be things being done. So like Jesus said, soon the night comes when no man can work. I must be about my father's business. We must be about the Father's business today because that night is vastly is quickly approaching. And people that want to support us, Dick's been so gracious and generous. But you take a guy like Sampath, and we've got 50 stories like that. And these young men, wow. they live in third world or in either Buddhist, Hindu, and Muslim Amen. cultures. You know how much Christian money there is in that culture? None. None. So where we have the youth pastor at our church that's funded by mm -hmm. the tithes of all these Christian people in the church, and here's a guy in a country that has 20 or 30 million young people who've never heard the gospel, and there is no Christian base for him to have any kind of support so he can go do this. So one of the things we do when we identify these young men, and, and they're already called by God. They're already, they're already passionate about Jesus and reaching young people. They have no resources. And so we're able to come along beside them and connect them to Christian people here in the U.S. And, and even in other countries where we put a little bit of resource in their hands, it's amazing what, what they can do. So, I mean, people out there say, I want to support Sampath. Well, I hope you will because he needs some more money right now. But what we have is we got 50 of those people. And, and these are the 50 we know. We're getting ready to go to 50 more countries that we've been invited that we don't know who that Sampath is yet, but they're already there. I, I was there in Nashville the night before you were leaving. You're packing up these new computers uh, to give to these leaders. Mm -hmm. And uh, hey, look, a MacBook Pro, uh, that's nothing to sneeze at. I mean, I make a living with this thing. You know, you produce TV shows, uh, and it's very, very valuable. I'll tell you what, uh, you're giving in the good soil, and, and, and they were crying. Yeah, they just when you were giving them because they don't have the, yeah. the, the, the the technical resources as well. We gave each. Now, these guys, we don't give them to everybody. Right. The guys that come in and they prove themselves that they're proven going to, long time, and, yeah. and they're going to be faithful to the cause, and they are they they have integrity and and discipline. They're doing it. Then we try to give them the best resources that we can give them. They've got old laptops that don't work half the time. They're always needing a video projector, cell phones that don't work. So when you walk into one of these guys and you give him a new MacBook Pro, you give him an iPhone 13. And you give him a digital, uh, a, a laser uh, video projector LCD. that he can take with him to all oh, these man. communities. You've given the world, and 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 they literally, I it was they just broke down and wept. Well, it, they've they've laid their lives down on the line. You know, to put things in perspective, a lot of these places, if if you if you're a Christian, you can't even have a bank account. Mm -hmm. You're not even allowed to have that necessarily. Yeah. Uh, uh, know some of that, but I'm telling you what, it's exciting to see a ministry that God is blessing with the harvest of souls. You know, we all like to talk about uh, bring them in, build them up, send them out. Sounds good. Sells books. When's the last time you really saw it happen? In this case, it happens all the time, folks. And, you know, we said it before in show one, you know, uh, find out what God is doing, get behind it. This is good soil because the harvest of souls, the leaders, I mean, the you know, the pictures themselves, self, you know, they say a picture says a thousand words, says a million words, student-led, true discipleship, true proven leaders, fruitful ministry, 
And, and it's not, and I hate to say this, but it's not Christian crud. It's not cheesy. You guys go, you, you go top, top rate for top rate results. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to put it in perspective, you know, the average DoorDash, about 59, 60 bucks for, yeah. for you know, a, a steak you're going to eat yeah. and forget about tomorrow. What could $60 do in one of these third? Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, $60 is a month's salary. Of guys who are willing that? to go, they're willing to go city to city and town to town and proclaim the gospel, and uh, we we spend that we thoughtlessly on a meal. One one DoorDash a month would pay mm -hmm. a salary of a month of ministry yeah. and mm -hmm. travel. Yeah. What would two of that do? What would three of that do? So cool. we're we're trying to fund guys at the global level. We've divided the world into eight regions, uh, and and each region has approximately a billion people in it, and uh, probably 60% of that billion is teenagers, so it's like 600 million. <clears throat> and we're trying to put a team in each region uh -huh. that will now go country to country in that region and build teams that will go city to city, that have teams that will go community to community. We literally, our, our vision is to have a uh, first priority, a student-led outreach of evangelism and discipleship in every community in the world. And, and, and yet you actually have a tangible plan, plan to get there. To, yeah. how, many, how often do you hear, well, yeah, we're supposed to win the world. Yeah, win, win, win the world. Well, how are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? You know, when, when I was a trainer for out, outreach marketing, we worked over, with over 300 pastors 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and God bless them. They've they done a good, good work. But a lot of these pastors say, so, you know, uh, why do you want to build a second campus? So we can build a third campus. Why do you want to build a, so we can have, Ten campuses. Why? They couldn't even tell me why at the mm -hmm. end of the day. They couldn't tell me why. They just wanted to build, build, build more. But the purpose of making disciples, mm -hmm. bringing people to Jesus, raising people up, the proof is in the pudding, Dick, yeah. and it's happening right now. What, what were you yeah. I, I was going to add something that's, I think, really important. Because you were saying how these governments are unfriendly to them and all. They still are somewhat, but those governments over there are becoming more friendly. They may not be helping them, but they're not fighting them. In most places, they're not putting them in jail. They're sometimes intimidating them a little. But God is preparing this. We're not talking about America. You can see they're doing every day trying to stop, not only get rid of oil, they're trying to shut down everything to do with God. But in these other countries, that's not happening. These doors are opening. These people are finding ways to go where they couldn't go. It's not wide open. But he is changing it. And they're here, first priority is here as this is happening. And we're talking about saving souls. We've got a short window, and the governments there are not as unfriendly as they are. And these are people in the cultures. They know where to go and how mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah. Not like us sending missionaries that take a year or two to learn the language and culture. They know it. And everything is fit today for us to send the funds and the people... Not send so many people because the people are in these. They're there. They're there. They're they're there. there. They, they can win six times, ten times mm -hmm. more people oh. immediately because they're already. God has there. got it ready. All he God. needs is for us. And he don't need us. He's making it where we can do it. He don't have to have us to do it. It's our privilege get to get to, to do part. it. And we mm -hmm. need to realize he has created and he's done. In this case, it's almost different than the Bible. He said, Paul a plant and... The other in the water and God brings in the harvest. Well, he'll bring the harvest there, but he's preparing the fields over there mm. and said, where are the workers? We need to get the workers there. You know, the, the, one of the presidents of one of these countries came to my friend and gathered every Christian leader he could. And he said, I am Muslim and I will always be Muslim, but we have noticed that every country that has Christianity in its base is healthier, safer, mm -hmm. more prosperous, and we want to know why. Is it safe to say, Dick and Benny, that perhaps these governments are seeing that first priority leaders and, and followers are actually better citizens? Mm -hmm. it, it, the, 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 it's not worth not persecuting only, them. They're better citizens. Not only are they seeing it, they're saying it. There's a difference. Wow. See, we're, we're now saying these young people, <laughs> that are coming out of this, they're amazing young people. And you know, they they love you. They pray for you. Uh, I, I remember they don't steal. Yeah. They don't loot. They yeah. don't burn down cities. Yeah. yeah. So um, so they see. It's obvious when 
uh, when you have these young people that are living for Jesus and mm-hmm. they have the, 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 the heart of Jesus and his nature and his character, uh, they are light in darkness. And, and it, the light shines in the darkness. This is, it, uh, I've got one story. Please, please. A, an so. India story, a little girl named Shiny. Today's her birthday. She turns 21 oh. today. But uh, her dad is one of our leaders in India. And uh, they're in this, you know, predominantly Hindu country. And so she can't get into school. They won't let her into school because they know her family's Christian. So she's homeschooled. And finally, the principal of the school leaves. You know Peter. Mm-hmm. He's been in your home. I love so, him. Yeah. And so uh, they, they won't let her in the school. Finally, the principal of the school dies, and they bring in a new principal. Well, Peter says, well, let's try this principal. We go in. Well, he says, sure, she can come in. Well, she just she graduated a couple years ago now as the top student in the school. You go to that school that wouldn't let her in, and you have the poster out front for the school. She's the poster child for the school. <laughs> and so she, here's this little Christian girl that's now the poster. They said, this is the kind of students that we produce at our school. But that's, you know, and it's just all over her. Um, wow. But, yeah, they, they see the difference. You know, I'm excited about this because <laughs> somewhere along the way we, we separated – humanitarian from spiritual and they go hand in hand but for those who are spiritual minded and want to make a spiritual impact (laughs) here you go folks i mean the plan is in place the plan is being executed it's all the execution the plan is being executed but also for those who are humanitarian minded you also are able to fulfill that desire Mm -hmm. uh, to, to see your investment into the lives of people Go far beyond well, your years well, if the Lord tears. Let me give you an example. There right you here. go. I knew, uh, I knew, I knew okay, you had one. Okay, here we go. So <laughs> in uh, in Myanmar, Myanmar. Yes, I, knew, I was Burma. hoping you talk about okay. that. And uh, so we have this leader in Myanmar. Uh, Dick funded our training center there, so we now have a Christian training center. It's beautiful, yeah. In a Buddhist country, and uh, so out of this uh, out of this center, not only are we training kids and sending them across that country to do event to literally plant churches and reach people. And these are sending teenagers to do this. They're doing quite well. But during COVID, that center became where people came to get medicine. Wow. When people didn't have any food, they th- that's the center where they came to get food. We just sent more money to them. By the way, yesterday, uh, Mark said there's a bunch of families starving, so we sent some more money over for them to distribute food in this Buddhist community. The, the, this Buddhist community around this center love our center because that's where they get loved. They're sending their kids to the center wow. to learn English. So Mark's teaching them English, and guess what their textbook is? Wow. The Bible. Wow. <laughs> so they're teaching all these Buddhist kids English, teaching them to how to read the Bible. So you're talking about, yes, we're sharing the gospel with a generation of young people, but all the humanitarian things that go on, wow. Jason, that. I got to say one thing, one more thing. Socialism, I mean, uh, uh, social justice without Jesus is socialism. Wow. See, the social justice is, is a command to the church. You take Jesus out, it becomes the government. Wow. Social justice without Jesus is socialism. Socialism without Jesus is communism. So yes. basically, you, you turn it not only over to the government, but eventually you eliminate God from the whole equation. And, and then what it becomes destructive mm-hmm. and controlling, not life-giving. Without the Spirit of God, th- there's no life in it. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, we believe in social justice, but we need, it needs to come from the church, from the believers. From the Prince of Peace? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Let, yeah. me, let me add one thing about that. This thing is built however it is, it's conspicuous where it's at because, I mean, it it's looks a nice. Beautiful but people, center. so Muslims, I mean, Buddhists have been coming for miles away. Several showed, 250 showed up a month or two ago. What are y'all doing here? In other words, it's a curiosity to them. We're teaching about Jesus. Who's that? We've never heard of Jesus. Well, Mark proceeds to tell them what Jesus is, and a bunch of them are saved. Well, not long after a week or so, they come back. They want to build them a church in their community several miles away, and they, and they needed, said, $7,000. How do they do it? He said, well, at Bamboo, 
Well, golly, here's the money. I want to see what a seven thousand dollar church. Bamboo church. It's a neat like. looking church. <laughs> There's others want to do it. Oh yeah. So the curiosity. What does that mean? Buddhists are looking. Yeah. Hindus are looking. Mm -hmm. Muslims are looking. We're we. The first priority is there for them to find what they're looking for, mm -hmm. and when they find it. There's a pastor friend of ours out of Houston, been a long time, John McTurnan. He preached to 18,000 Muslims in Pakistan. 8,000 came to the Lord. A few weeks later, he preached to about, oh, it says 1,200-plus Hindus in Pakistan, not a Hindu nation, but it's next to India. Over 1,000 came to the Lord. Wow. They're doing it in these other countries, and God is opening it up, and these people are looking and seeking, yeah. why are we not? There more. Why are we? What are we doing over here? Mm -hmm. Building edifices and all. There's where the souls mm -hmm. need to be saved. We need to save them here too, because the fields are kind of white to harvest. But the government's trying to keep our fields from being white to mm -hmm. harvest around yeah. it. We need to fight that, and that's a political battle today. But over there, there's a different dynamic. And well, they're, they're sending and missionaries we here. In it. Yeah. yeah, more more than ever in the in, in first time in our history. Amen. But on on a on a humanitarian level, on a social justice level, on a ministry, spiritual level, on a vocational level, Amen. on every positive level, you are not only enacting a plan to bring change and to be the light of the world, but you're enacting a plan Amen. to reach every person on the planet. Yeah. And again, I've said it before, I'll say it again, first priority uh, global is is the personification of the Great Commission preaching the gospel of the kingdom all over the world. There's a there's 2.5 billion young people on earth that have never heard the gospel. 2.5 billion. Now that is 25,000 million. Wow. wow. 25,000 million young people have never heard the gospel. And the, somebody said, how do you reach them? And I said, you plan to. That's how you reach them. It's not just going to happen. You have to go out and plan to reach them. You have to go and equip and send people wow. and go where they are and tell them the story. And that's what we're trying to do. Raise a new generation of gospel messengers in every community in the world. And, and the hearts are prepared mm -hmm. and the people are hungry. We still have the resources, folks, to do it. And where your treasure is, there, there your heart will be also. I tell you what, uh, I am so honored mm. to be involved with First Priority Global. Go to firstpriority.global right now. And I tell you, I, I can tell you from, from behind the scenes to what you see right here and beyond, uh, it's wonderful to see a pure ministry yeah. fulfilling the work. And that to God be the glory. To, yeah. to God yeah. be the glory, not to the man. That's yeah. right.